Welcome to the Latter-day Freeman podcast, a podcast dedicated to building a movement of Latter-day Saints united in defense of the principles of freedom and our inspired constitution. I am your host, Jacob Hibbert, and I'm joined as I am each week by my fellow Freeman, by Tyson Hardcastle and Jeremy Anderson. Jeremy Tyson, so great to have you with me, with me tonight. I'm really excited for the discussion that we're going to have, and we're going to be talking about the, the proper role of government. And there are competing visions of what the proper role of government is that, depending on where you fall on that, makes some of those activities justified and some of those not. And one, one point of view that is, I think it's a little extreme, but I think you see elements of the mentality. And it comes from an essay that Woodrow Wilson wrote called Socialism and Democracy. And socialism is, I think, a, a little bit more of an extreme view for most people. I don't think too many people identify as socialists, but I do think that what's described here, you see elements a little bit of this idea in a lot of uh, political circles and, and behind some policies that exist. And so this is how Woodrow Wilson describes socialism, socialism's view of the role of government. And he said, yeah, it, it said it being state socialism proposes that all idea of a limitation of public authority by individual rights be put out of view and that the state consider itself bound to stop only at what is unwise or futile in its universal superintendence alike of individual and of public interests. The thesis of the state socialist is that no line can be drawn between private and public affairs, which the state may not cross at will. That omnipotence of legislation is the first postulate of of all just political theory. So that's the, the, the state socialist view of government and if it should have limitations, which essentially no limitations except for what's practical or how it best describes the balancing of individual and, pro- and public interests. And that there can be no line really drawn between a public affair and a private affair. Tyson, Jeremy, what are your responses to, to that view? Is this an extreme view in your, in your opinion? The first thing that comes to my mind is I, I'm asking the question, what kind of a society is is this role of government creating? Like, what's the end goal here? If the socialist thinks that government should be able to do everything and anything it wants in, in private and public affairs, um, why? What are they trying to accomplish? A- and I don't have quotes here. I wish I did. But um, it seems like when you talk about socialism, the end goal is you want equal economic outcomes is, is kind of, that's the end goals. We want everyone to be on the same economic footing. Everyone have the same stuff, the same amount of, of wealth. And um, that's kind of the definition of we made it to the society that we want in socialism. And so for me, then it, the question becomes, is that the society that we really want? Like, is that the kind of, because if that's the role that you give government, um, doing whatever they, whatever they want to create this kind of um, society, are we really, is that really where we're trying to go? And, and I would definitely say, no, that's, that's not where we're trying to go. But I think I might be pulling away from your original question a little bit. Uh, so my mind, when you say that, uh, goes to a lot of what um, Bastiat, Frederick Bastiat and the law talks about towards the latter half of his, of the law. And I actually just lost the quote. So he, he talks a lot about how legislators feel like they, mu- they need to take it upon themselves to mold or uh, form the clay or or society into a perfect form and how kind of presumptuous that is. And I think you can actually see it in all sorts of government entities from striving to make sure that our economy is top notch all the time and like pumping uh, stimulus into the economy to make sure that it rebounds to, you know, like preventing forest fires, things like that. You know, we're trying to mold our environment so it matches this perfect always on the rise form and uh to me that that seems like it's overreaching their bounds 
Uh, what you said there kind of reminded me of a quote from Barack Obama that he uh, said in uh, December of 2013, you know, we're still coming out of the 2008 financial crisis. And he said, but government can't stand on the sidelines in our efforts to rebuild the economy because government is us. And I, I kind of also with what Jeremy saying, you know, what kind of society do you want to live in? There are some people who say whatever their end goal society is justifies the means of what it is to get there. And, you know, if we have X vision of a society and this is such a good thing, then, of course, government power is is justified to get to that end. And and I think that that is that view both expressed in Wilson and that kind of mentality. Well, the government's just us. And so, you know, if you say you don't want the government to do something, you're saying you don't want us to do it. Um, I think that's quite different from what we know to be the inspired proper role of government as taught by the scriptures, by prophets and apostles, and by other inspired individuals. And so when I think of the proper role of government as found in the scriptures, um, I immediately think of section 134 of the Doctrine and Covenants, um, which is a section that was, um, it was written, it was not, it's not a revelation in the same way that some of the other sections of the Doctrine and Covenants, where it's Christ speaking, um, but it's a set of beliefs about the role of government and the role of religion in society that was adopted and canonized as scripture. And so it is as authoritative as any of the other sections of the Doctrine and Covenants. And in verse two of that section, um, it says this, it says, we believe that no government can exist in peace, except such laws and are framed and held and violate as will secure to each individual the free exercise of conscience, the right and control of property, and the protection of life. And so to me, when I think of the proper role of government is securing rights, like the Declaration of Independence says, to secure these rights governments are instituted among men. And then in the scriptures, like this one, specifically rights such as conscience, life, uh, owning and controlling your property are, are rights that government exists to secure. But so that I guess that's kind of my short answer of, you know, and I'm not sure what the proper role of government is, but would either of you uh, have a different definition or, or uh, want to elaborate on some some thoughts on what the proper role of government is? No, I think that um, that captures it really well. I especially like your reference to the, the Declaration of Independence. Um, I feel like that's a very um, powerful explanation of, of the proper role of government and, and the proper role of the people in relation to government, um, especially government that's kind of gone crazy. But um, I would just add that I, I think the same way with the thesis of, of socialism being um, we're trying to create this equal economic outcome society, the reason we have this role of government that um, it's just to secure justice and it's just to um, secure rights is it goes back to the kind of society that we're kind we're trying to create where we want a society that um, like president oak said where maximum freedom for men and women to act according to their individual choices is is what we have he says that's the most desirable condition for the exercise of agency and it's because we want to create a society where people learn and grow and, and go back to live with Heavenly Father again. Yeah, that phrase, uh, maximum freedom, I really love. It reminds me of a quote from Barry Goldwater in his book, The Conscience of a Conservative, where he says, the legitimate functions of government are actually conducive to freedom, maintaining internal order, keeping foreign, foreign foes at bay, administering justice, removing obstacles to the free and exchange, interchange of goods, the exercise of these powers make it possible for men to follow their chosen pursuits with maximum freedom. And I just, I love that phrase, maximum freedom. And President Benson also used it in a talk, uh, Freedom and Free Enterprise, where he said that the best way, the American way is still maximum freedom for the individual guaranteed by a wise government that provides for the police department and national defense. So again, like you, I, I love that phrase and I love that you highlighted it. And it reminded me of those two quotes from two inspired men. I am 100% positive that President Oaks was aware of the legacy of that phrase that he was building on <laughs> when he wrote this talk. I think uh, we just need to be careful too when we talk about maximum freedom because I I think we've heard even on 
you know, earlier episodes in this podcast, people use the word freedom in, a, in the incorrect way. When, when you say freedom, we're not saying that so-and-so should have the freedom to access whatever health care he or she desires. That's, that comes with a second, you know, if you pick up that end of the stick, the other end of that stick is, well, somebody is being forced to, to dispense that freedom or that health care, and thus their freedom is being restricted. And so when we're, we're saying freedom, we need to remember there's two ends of that stick and we can't infringe on the rights of other people and obstruct their freedom in the process of securing total freedom. That's a great point. To, to freedom does not mean uninhibited action, like in a pure sense. Thomas Hobbes described freedom that way and that's not how we're talking about freedom. Uh, Thomas Jefferson in his inaugural address, uh, presidential speech he gave, said a wise and frugal government which shall restrain men from injuring one another shall leave them otherwise free to regulate their own pursuits and improvements. So when we talk about maximum freedom is maximum freedom for every individual to act, meaning that you can't infringe on each other's freedom and actions that do that, that are illegitimate. So if we've kind of established that this is the proper role of government, that it's to secure rights, to create this environment of maximum freedom for individuals to act on their choices with while checked by the equal rights of others, why should the role of why should the role of government though just be limited just to that? There's all these other problems that exist in society beyond the problem of people sometimes hit each other on the head, take each other's stuff, vandals come over the walls, we have disputes. There's all these other problems that exist. Why is the proper role of government just limited solely to securing rights? So you bring up DNC 134 when you're thinking on this topic. I think DNC 121 kind of appeals to this this portion of the question. Um, Verse 39, we have learned by sad experience that it is the nature and disposition of almost all men. As soon as they get a little authority, as they suppose, they will immediately begin to exercise unrighteous dominion. And so suddenly this tool that society can use or government, you know, when we combine our our will and our efforts to secure freedoms can become this monster you know especially when there's only one or two people at the top of it you know relative to the body who are exercising that force and that that power um unfortunately it is uh the true outcome almost always that people begin to abuse that power well and i don't remember who this quote was from but I thought it was Bastia said about talked about um, the necessity of a superior force. Government had to have uh, a force that's bigger than uh, you know the biggest stick, bigger stick than everybody else, and um, that's exactly so that it can enforce rights, so that it can um, ensure justice. But if you allow for a little gray area. When you have the biggest stick, you start to misuse it a little bit. And um, unless you keep those lines really clear, I think that's exactly what happens, like Tyson is saying. Well, and unfortunately, it's not even necessarily intentional abuse. Uh, Unfortunately, oftentimes it's this notion that it is for the common good of man that we're doing this, that we're forcing the system to be this perfect outcome. Uh, we're telling ourselves it's because we're trying to dispense, you know, charity and love and concern for everybody around. But what we don't really get, get to see very clearly is that we're trampling on the agency of man. And that that gift alone is is so big in God's plan that if we remove it, we almost, well, we completely decimate, you know, or obliterate the reason why we're here on earth. I think you both have made really good points uh, to what to what uh, to Jeremy's point about, you know, government is definitionally has a monopoly on the legitimate use of force within a geographical area. And government is necessary to secure rights because and like Jeremy said, Bastiat talks about this, that government can't function without having superior force. And then Elder H. Rowan Anderson of the 70 in a book he wrote called The Book of Mormon of the Constitution talks about how it's government's ability to have superior force to everyone in society, but then also having impartial judgment that makes it able to secure rights in society. Without those two elements, it can't do that. And it's the only, the only entity that can. 
And whenever it acts, then it's acting through force. When the government says, don't go, don't do this, and you do it, there is an implicit that, you know, or else is, is kind of essentially that's always kind of hanging there. And it has to be able to enforce that or else on you if it's going to be able to secure rights. And I think that that issue then of if government is force, going back, going back to what we talked about last week with Bastiat, we know that there are certain moral rules about when force is justified. And we as individuals are justified to use force to secure our rights from external threats. And if government is our common agent, and it only acts through force or the threat of force, it too has to be bound by the moral laws of when force is morally justified. And so going back to the book, to the Goldwater quote, when you look at the proper role of government in securing rights, it's the only role it could possibly have and the functions that it needs to do that, such as providing national defense, uh, police force, law enforcement and courts, all of those elements secure rights to one degree or another or 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 you know there are some ancillary functions that it prepare that it performs that makes it possible to do that and so it and at least to me in a lot of ways it all comes down to when is force is justified and like you said tyson because angels aren't men are not angels which is why number one we need government uh, as as uh, madison says in federalist 51 one, the second half is then the great difficulty of government is because men are not angels and government government is made up of men, you have to also bind government and try to control it so that power, which does exist, doesn't corrupt. For our listeners, it might feel like we're kind of we kind of jumped over what is the proper role of government, that question a little bit and went a little bit fast. Um, I would point you back to the the podcast episode we had last week um, about Friedrich Bastiat's book, The Law, we really explain, or I guess discuss a lot about that question in that book, because he talks about what is the proper role of the law, essentially. And those, those two, the government and the law, are very much tied together. Yeah, that's a great point. So I think we've done a good job explaining a little bit, maybe we could have been a little bit clearer that what the, the proper role of government is, which is to secure rights and why it needs to be limited. But I think that the practical question then becomes for us as Latter-day Freemen, as individuals who believe in freedom and understand that government needs to have a limited role, how is it then that we keep government limited? What are the principles or mechanisms that exist that are designed to keep government limited. And I've, I came up with a few ideas, but I, I also wanted to hear what you, Tyson and you, Jeremy, what kind of thoughts you have on how we then, since we have this institution that's so necessary to, to protect, to, to secure rights, but is also such a threat at the same time, how, how do we keep it to its good positive role? So for me, this question goes back to, um some discussions that we've had, not on the air, but we've had among us before um, about kind of society and the fact that you need more in society than government. To have a, a happy functioning society and this society where rights are secure, you need more than a government that's protecting those rights. Um, Thomas Jefferson said, I know no safe depository of the ultimate powers of the society but the people themselves. And if we think them not enlightened enough to exercise their control with a wholesome discretion, the remedy is not to take it from them, but to inform their discretion by education. This is the true corrective of abuses of constitutional power. He said that in like, I think it was 1820 um, in a letter. 1820, that's a pretty big year. Yeah, yeah it is. Um, and there's there's another one from Governor Morris, who was a, a signer of the Constitution. He says, for avoiding the extremes of despotism or anarchy, the only ground of hope must be on the morals of the people. I believe that religion is the only solid base of morals and that morals are the only possible support of free government. Therefore, education should teach the precepts of religion and the duties of man towards God. So the, the two things that I see in there that can really help limit government is 
one, education. You need the people to be enlightened. You need them to understand government and its proper role, um, especially in a democratic republic. And, and also the religion and morals. And, and that's tied also to education. You need to be educating people about religion and about their duties toward God. Yeah, I really love that. And that really goes back to our discussion on the second pillar and the importance of why individual morality is such an important pillar is it's that it's that uh, second part of the pincer movement. It's that key support that, you know, in so many ways helps government stay in its proper role. And, and like you said, education, uh, it reminded me of a quote from President Benson from his talk, uh, The Constitution of Heavenly Banner, saying to us as members of the church specifically, he said, that we must learn the principles of the Constitution and then abide by its precepts. Have we read the, read the Constitution and pondered it? Are we aware of its principles? Could we defend it? Can we recognize when a law is constitutionally unsound? And so, like you said, you know, that educated, being an educated populace, that being constitutionally literate, I guess you could say, is so important because if we know the government ha has rules, but we don't know the rules, we're not gonna do a very good job of keeping it within the rules. So one of the things that I thought of about how we keep government limited is I, I kind of went back to President Oaks' talk um, in general conference on the defending our defiantly inspired constitution and some of the other uh, talks that he references in the footnotes and, and came up with a few ideas of some things that stuck out to me. Um, I think one way that we keep government limited is the fact that we have a, rent, a written constitution that has enumerated powers like our founding fathers were so wise in the sense that like, okay, if we're gonna have this government, because in, in, in Europe and in, in England, uh, English, the, if you ask to read the English constitution, you're not gonna find it. It's constantly changing. It's built on court cases and laws and precedent. It, it's very fluid. And here in the United States, we have a written constitution that has established rules and with procedures to change those rules, but they're kind of slow, not very quick. And so just having standards that are set in stone of what government is to do and what it isn't to do, I think is really important. And then of course, going back to constitutional literacy, us knowing uh, what those roles are. Uh, another thing that stuck out to me from uh, our divinely inspired constitution is the concept of, a sep of separation of powers. So if we're gonna have power, because you know, it's unavoidable that government needs to have power to do its role, um, dividing it, and into separate branches. And uh, President Oak said, another inspired principle is the separation of powers. The inspiration in the American convention was to delegate independent executive, legislative and judicial powers. So these three branches could exercise checks on another. And there's, I found a lot of quotes from James Madison and the Federalist Papers about the importance of having separation of powers. And that if you get all the powers of government in one branch, that that's essentially elected despotism, which isn't good. And uh, Lord Acton said, Lord Acton also, this is a quote that I really liked a short one. He said, liberty consists in the division of power, absolute, absolutism in the concentration of it. So while we recognize the government has to have this authority and this power to secure rights, delegating different aspects of it to different things is, is really helpful. And then the duty then comes on us as members, as Latter-day Freeman is to ensure that those checks and balances, those separation of powers remain intact. David Old Miss K uh, said, uh, we have urged you above all to try to support good and conscientious candidates of either party who are aware of the great dangers inherent in communism and who are truly dedicated to the constitution and the tradition of our fathers. We have suggested also that you should support candidates who pledge their sincere, sincere fidelity to our liberty, a liberty which aims at the preservation of both personal and property rights. So I would just say, I mean, one of the ways is by being very active, uh, participating in elections and researching the elections so you know who you're voting for. Uh, the government is formed by consent of those who are governed. And so we have the ultimate power. It's by the people to keep it within its bounds. And that's the thing that, from all the different things we talked about. And we could also talk about like, you know, federalism and things like that. But to me, all of this really puts a burden on us 
as the people, like Jefferson said, you know, the safest repository is within the people. Limited government demands a lot of the people. It, it doesn't demand a lot of government. You know, we want government to do those things and we want it to be pretty dang good at it. We want it to be, we don't want weak government. We want strong, but limited government, but that requires strong and active people and citizens. And so this might, it might be kind of like, wow, like why would we want a limited government? It's going to require so much of it. It's because freedom's that precious. And at least to me, like listening to, to this discussion and being a part of that, that's something that's just hit me a lot is like, a lot is required of us um, under limited government, but the blessings for that are really immense. Well, I, I think another aspect of keeping government limited isn't necessarily being a part of the force that is restraining it from becoming something that it's not, but a part of that is filling that void that we strive to have the government fill, which is not proper for it to fill. And so we want the government to be charitable well, how about go out and be charitable yourself and promote charitable endeavors that are, you know, privately led endeavors. We want, uh, we want the government to clean up the environment. Well, why don't we, out of our personal convictions, support those institutions that promote that in our society? Yeah, I think, um, <clears throat> and you're saying like, we want the government to do this. I think it's more of, we want a, a clean environment and we want um, people who are impoverished or are having difficulties, um, economic difficulties, we want them to be taken care of and we want children to be educated and we want all of these things to happen. And, and a lot of them, we actually need them to happen for our society to function well. But that doesn't mean that the government is, is who should be making that happen. There are other, um, we can form other institutions and there are other institutions actively working to accomplish those ends and we need to support them and we need to make them happen. So I, I agree. I think it's, it's equally vital that we support the institutions that fill those voids as it is that we help restrain government within its proper bounds. Oh, absolutely. Because like you said, all these other things that are necessary can be accomplished without force or the threat of force. However, when it comes to restraining crime, punishing crime, having you know, an impartial judge to enforce rules, those all, those, all those things require force if it's gonna have any meaning at all, which is why government does it. And I mean, just kind of makes you wanna go start like a bowling club or go like, you know, build and like really invest in those institutions. I mean, think about as members of the church, as you know, as priesthood holders and as sisters, you know, we have the Relief Society program and we have our elders quorums. I mean, I don't think I think about this at like this. I've never thought of it this way, but you're helping to build up society and keep the government rule limited when you are active, strong participant in your quorum and Relief Society groups. Like you're doing something that obviously is spiritual and beneficial that way, but it's also has all these civil civic kind of benefits as well that have amazing that bless people's lives and help us maintain a free society and so yeah like we should be as invested like you said in maintaining institutions that exist in society like the family like churches voluntary organizations as we are in being vigilant in uh, ensuring that government's role is limited well, I think this has been a really good discussion, and I, I really appreciate both you and Tyson and, and you, Jeremy, your thoughts that you shared um, on this really important issue. And, you know, with all the pillars discussions as we go through these, the purpose of these discussions and podcasts like this one is to help you understand the framework, the principles that we then apply as we engage in society, as we see issues come up in ideas. These are the divine inspired principles that we know um, have been given that lead to prosperity, that lead to freedom. And if we can use these and understand them, then we can make better choices and be better informed, active citizens. And so I hope that uh, you continue to dive in that. We're going to try to uh, link some more um, resources in our show notes so that if you want to dive a little bit deeper into things from the law or different talks from general authorities about this or 
at, you know, excerpts from the Federalist Papers or some things, we'll be sure to put those in the show notes for you so that you can, uh, like I said, dig deeper into some of these principles of, and important aspects of the proper role of government and then start to apply them yourself. Um, if you haven't yet, be sure to like and subscribe on YouTube and to follow us on whatever platform of podcasts that you listen to. We are on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, and a host of other places. So if you haven't yet, follow. Also, be sure to share the podcast with your friends and with people who are like-minded or even people who aren't like-minded. Um, you know, see what they think and, and practice having good discussions about principles. So that will always lead us in the right direction. And if you have a suggestion for the podcast or an idea for a topic, and yes, we are going to get to those. We've gotten a few. We are going to get to them. Uh, send them to us either on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, or you can email the show directly at latterdayfreeman76 at gmail.com. But for Jeremy and Tyson, thank you so much for being with us, and we will see you all next week.